accent. I'm not going to apologise for that. <laughs> good afternoon, everyone. Thanks very much for coming to my talk and not going through the talk. They were all very good talks. I've been to excellent talks this afternoon, so thanks very much for supporting this course. So I'll start with a quick introduction about who I am, what I do, so you get the background to why this talk came about, the concept, and the subsequent abstract. Um, my role at the moment is a security research. I perform botnet malware analysis, uh, risk analysis and intelligence, threat intelligence as well as risk. I work out of the UK in Warrington. That's outside of London for those that are not, not, not part of the UK or have travelled today. I also spend two days a week at UK CERT, uh, part of the fusion cell. This is a government initiative, so I work alongside uh, government operatives in a very secret office down in London. I can't tell you anything about that. So what this talk will not be about, it's easier to probably cancel out what the talk will not be about than it will be to include what it will be about. It will not be about Pokemon Go. So anyone that's not interested in what this talk will be about and has been busy checking Pokemon, and I've seen a few people doing it already, you're welcome to leave. It will also not include any references whatsoever to the on current ongoing presidential election in the US. Anyone from the US who I can offend? Excellent, okay, so we'll continue on to the serious stuff. So the abstract for this, sorry, hold this mic. The abstract for this paper was the difficulty in communicating to board members or executives, what we would probably refer to as non-technical people, or people who are technical once and no longer able to keep up with the change of pace. Some of these, abs some of these frameworks are there to help us all. Sarbanes-Oxley, DSS, PCI. So a number of people will probably be familiar with these. Just by a show of hands, can you just show your hands if any of these frameworks affect you directly? So that's a minority, I would say, less than, less than a quarter of the room. For those that don't know those frameworks, can you just raise your hand? So a couple of people, that's fine. It's not a, it's not a test. So the reason I asked that question is because these directives are intrinsically linked to the work that you day on a day to, do on a day-to-day -day basis. So is anyone part of a SOC? and work in a network operations center, okay. So the reason that these critical frameworks that you probably need to have a quick look at and reference into your day-to-day -day work are important is because these are what matter to the board. These are what matter to CISOs, CTOs. Why is that? It's because there's a gap analysis between the SOC and the people who report into the SOC or who visit them just for sandwich breaks. You know those sorts of people, right? So effectively managing risks this is a topic of discussion probably for everybody in the room. We have risk management. Has everyone got a risk for everything that they know about in their business? This risk register looks somewhat like this. You know, we've protected our boundaries, but right in the middle there is a way to circumnavigate those boundaries. We can talk about managing risks all day long. We really can. One example of managing risk or in an inappropriate management of risk is M&A. Has anyone undergone any M&A recently? Bought a company that was smaller than your company, potential business offerings. Yeah. So we talk about supply chains. We talk about the risk that was potentially small when the company was pre-M&A becomes a much larger risk after M&A. And that's a risk which has now become a threat. There is a threat. There is a risk. These are not the same. Does anyone disagree? Feel free to disagree. That's good, OK. So would anyone like to tell me why they're not the same? Or I can tell you why, okay. We know what risks look like, we know what threats look like. Something has to happen in between there for one to turn into another. There is a lot around me at the moment and I've had to be very, very careful where I stand. A lot of risks. So I can trip over and fall and bang my knee. That has then now become a threat. It doesn't quite work like that way in cyberspace, unfortunately. So now we move on to the perception. Who knows what this is? Close, it's, I think it's Norse, it may be, maybe Fire Eye, if I'm wrong, sorry. So who's got one of these? Who uses this in their sock or knock? Anyone gonna own up to that? Okay, so this is a perception. There's nothing wrong with laying a perception down. For those who aren't at, in the coal face day to day, this sells a story, this tells a very simplistic story. So we all know what this map does. It's a live attack map, isn't it? No, it's not a live attack map. So that's the problem. This is a honeypot, ma honeypot map. It does absolutely nothing to do with live attacks. Welcome to the internet, this is called. If you've got a presence on the internet, you will be attacked. Norse or FireEye, whoever developed this map, 
saw this as an opportunity to have an almost differential in this area. They thought, we'll demonstrate what an attack looks like for executives to be able to consume. Executives love this map, absolutely adore it. Show me the threat map, show me the pew pew. Are you hacking in your hoodie? Has anyone, hack has anyone ever hacked in a hoodie? No, I didn't think so. So yeah, it's an ongoing joke. You know, um, in, all, in all corporate slides, there is one of these images. There's one in mine, there's one in probably yours. Um, I don't own a hoodie, I'm nearly 40. If I was seen in a hoodie, I'd, I'd lose a lot more respect. So that's the perception. We've grown this perception on the back of a lot of um, negative press, together with these sorts of threat maps. You know, everyone's familiar with the threat book map. That's the one I prefer, because it basically pokes one in the eye of threats. So we'll move on from the perception to some of the reality. Multinational, has anyone worked for multinationals? Large scale, multi-corporates, yeah. So APT, if you have any IPR, any capabilities to develop CPNI infrastructure, you're probably going to be an APT target. Now when you say APT, say it quietly, because it gets people very excited. I know this, because it helps get CapEx signed off. If you need budget for something, just mention APT. You don't even have to define it. It's very, very simple. But on a serious note, not everyone is a target for APT. You may be a target for people that deliver macro malware. That's still a threat. It's still a risk. So um, I asked before how many analysts were in the room, people who spend a lot of time in front of a computer monitor actually doing work, who know what this means. Just, just raise your hands. Absolute analyst, okay. So there's a very, very fine line between being an analyst and, and being able to communicate risks effectively to a board member or to an executive, CTO. We're talking about the office of CTO here. If I show this to a CTO, hands on heart, does anybody know what they would say? Would they be able to communicate to you what you know? Probably not, and that's not their fault, that's not their role, they would say. But having a base understanding of these threats are critical. I refer back to the previous slide about the frameworks that sort of protect us as analysts. It's key that we understand those frameworks. It's two-way. So the reality to the analyst is this. The reality to the criminal is this. They just care about money. That's all they care about. So we can flip that on its head, the reality to the board. Is anyone in the telecommunications sector? No, that's good. So we can talk about talk talk as a case study. Unfortunately, case, the case study is pristine. It's an absolute perfect case study for anyone to look how to acknowledge risk or not acknowledge risk, depending on your viewpoint. So we talk about this skills gap in cybersecurity. You know, Talos are outside trying to hire, um, Rapid7 are trying to hire. We're looking for these good, skilled people. The reality to the board is directly impacted by this lack of skills. So a teenager caused a, a massive amount of damage to what is effectively a CPNI market partner. Talk Talk supply very, very critical infrastructure to the UK government. And this was done by a teenager. I, I've had a question before about how old this guy was, and I've had 13, 14, 15, and 16. I know he was a teenager, and that's all I know. And he literally was in his bedroom, probably wearing a hoodie. But at the moment, the biggest problem for you as an analyst is getting this message across. You can see over a period of a number of months where numerous risks were communicated to Talk Talk. There was XSS, there was SQLi, these were all publicly available, and a number of times they were informed. So for whatever reason, and I'm not using Talk Talk as a, a yardstick to beat with, this is a case study that risk was not appropriately communicated. And the end result was Dido Harding was in front of a parliamentary committee as a result to explain why. So there could have been 30, 40 people telling Dido Harding that we need to fix this infrastructure. But the person on the end of this information receiving it probably didn't understand what it, me what it meant. And that was made clear by Dido calling it a sequel, sequel didn't refer to it in the proper terminology, but she was communicated wrong. And that is an absolute perfect example of risks not being communicated effectively. So I'm not going to stand up here and say, oh, I work in security, we're great. You know, we've got companies in the room at the moment who have been subject to incidents. Hack team, whoever knows about the hacking team from Italy, sold, traded in commodity exploits, they were hacked. The past couple of weeks we've seen some, what we would 
referred to as cyber weapon auctions, whatever that is. We can't all be great. We can't all be perfect, but we can mitigate, we can identify risks. So from a standpoint, from my perspective, is I can identify risk early. I can communicate that risk early. Subject matter experts, we know what we're talking about. Well, I think I do sometimes. I can communicate, hopefully, in a way which someone above me can digest and disseminate appropriately. Clearly, a company, or sorry, an entity as large as the NSA has got massive, massive scope. This may not apply to them. So we've got dissidents inside the NSA who've moved to Eastern European countries who are now being blamed for this sort of incident. So it can backfire. Now we move on to what I mentioned before. I told you there would be no mentions at all to do with the US presidential election. I lied, I'm sorry. So we'll talk a little bit about how risk turns into a threat. And again, perfect case study. I, could, I couldn't have written this. You couldn't have looked it up on the internet. This is a Wikipedia article which you can almost copy verbatim for a case study. So in 2010, Hillary Clinton decided that she did not need any sort of security. She'd been probably Bill Clinton's closest ally outside the security team in the White House for, for the DNI, and was basically, she did not want security from the White House. She communicated by her own personal device. There is a, uh, there is a um, document online, which I can share in the slides, which shows a conversation between Hillary and the, what was effectively the IT team. Hillary says, I don't want a BlackBerry because my emails go to spam. Hillary then built an email server in her basement. I don't know what it is with Americans, building email servers in their basements, in big basements. I don't know why, why they're so possessed by that, but it is what it is. But the problem with that is she did not perceive that in a couple of years' time she would be a presidential elective and then become a greater target, which is effectively a supply chain, a human element of a supply chain. But the problem was everyone else realized that that was a problem, particularly, maybe, potentially, maybe, an Eastern European company, country, sorry. The attribution part I'm gonna leave, that's not my talk. But whatever the problem was, the risk was not communicated to Hillary that she may one day stand to be president. The most powerful woman in the world had an email server in her basement. That's the end result. How that can happen is a catalog of errors from the bottom to the top. No one person will be blamed, clearly. But this doesn't stop, it does come down. So this is a story from the past week. These stories almost write themselves. In the past week, this was a SEC filing. Someone resigned because they were too running an email server in their basement. This is not fictitious. The SEC filing is at the bottom there. I get the opportunity to use this excellent laser. In the past week, this guy has resigned and he was a major shareholder in this bank. You, you, you can't make this up. So the most powerful woman in the world leads by example, puts an email server in her basement. So then someone who's managing finances does exactly the same. Leading by example leads to bad choices. So I don't think any slide deck is complete without some mysterious but well used phrase. Is anyone familiar with the 36 stratagems? It is an actual phrase. It is an essay written by the Chinese. Okay, that's good. So this is a Chinese essay used to illustrate a series of stratagems used in politics, in war, and interaction. The theme of loss is key to this talk because when we identify risk, it becomes a threat if we don't communicate. So there's one line I've highlighted. This is a quote from the, the, this particular stratagem. There are 36. And this one stood out because it was so cognizant. Sacrifice the plum tree to preserve the peach tree, which essentially means We've got greater goals to sacrifice. We've got lesser goals to sacrifice if we all live. Again, not using talk talk as an example, but a lot of companies stood up and took notice. It was that this was on our doorstep. This was effectively one of the biggest telecommunications company in the UK, hacked by a teenager in a hoodie in his bedroom. It doesn't get any more. The gravity of that conversation you have with executives really does resonate. To be able to say that these so-called I've only got one hand, sorry. So-called underage hackers taking down millions of pounds worth of infrastructure. That conversation really does resonate. But the conversation does not end there. 
because even when you tell a company, when you have limitless resources, as Target do and still and did at the time, this happens. So just by a show of hands, who knows what happens in Target? Okay, so for those that don't know, this is probably the most significant and titled cyber breach in the past couple of years, aside from OPM. This again is a case study, is that you can have all the resources, you can have all the manpower, but again, if the message is not communicated, then this will happen. So I've put some stats up there. This, this one here stands out. So does anyone manage CapEx or manage budgets? Yeah, so I would assume this one to you is a bit scary. Yeah, so I couldn't afford to lose £3.40 at the moment. Never mind $3.4 billion, and that's to date. That's in terms of insurance payouts. And the reason for that, the effective reason for that was logs were not reported appropriately. So they had inline visibility of malware leaving their network and credit card details leaving their network. But for some inexplicable reason, the alert was not, was not raised. They saw the alert and moved. I can't understand why. Can anyone explain why? Maybe they just didn't feel like alerting it. Nobody knows. But the end result is that 11 gigabytes of data was exfiltrated, 70 million personal records, and 30 million credit card details stolen. Big numbers for someone that doesn't want to acknowledge an alert. So Bloomberg did this GIF, and I absolutely love it because it's perfect. It sums up exactly what happened, is that they were an easy target. Well, that's what they would like everyone to believe. They were popped, forgive the phrase, by the supply chain. But effectively, when they did that M&A, they did not identify that risk. So real threats, real threats. Shodan, who uses Shodan? Everyone, I assume, yeah. Cool, isn't it? I really love it. It's not. It's the worst thing on the internet. You know why? Because anyone can use it. So your company will have a presence somewhere on the internet which is crawled by Shodan. My company does. Every company I support does. So that's why it's a worry. That risk, have you communicated the risk? And I'm using Shodan as a crawl and example purely because I know it's, everyone should have a familiarity with it. If you haven't, cool tool, go online. It's very, very cheap to buy an API access token and you get a lifetime access. But the problem with this is, this highlights just how broken security can be. Um, I attended Black Hat a couple of weeks ago. Did anyone go to Black Hat and see the talk from this? This was effectively looking for VNC on the internet and be able to pivot inside someone's network. I have never been so scared in my life. He was inside someone's network by browsing Shodan and he identified the CVE. A CVE assigned to the problem, a protocol used inside VNC. Does anyone use VNC, internet facing? No one's gonna admit to that, that's good. So we've got some less interesting stuff now, but equally critical to what the whole concept of this talk is about, and it's boardroom views. Has anyone ever been invited to talk to a CTO or a CEO about cyber issues? Is it a difficult conversation? Okay, so ev everyone's happy to see your face, okay. <laughs> so the problem that I have, or the problem that I've seen is when you approach or you have a conversation with board level members, they want stats, they want graphs. It's very, very difficult to measure risk in stats unless you can put an algorithm behind it. But thankfully, the most powerful country in the world have been able to measure that for us. Cyber is on the number one page of the worldwide threat assessment. We're all gonna be in the job for a very long time, thankfully. But the problem with that is, we're all gonna work very, very hard to get it off page one. So in 2012, there wasn't, much, there wasn't much conversation in the DNI report. DNI stands for Department of National Intelligence, by the way. There is links in the bottom to go and read this. It comes out, well, it usually comes out once a year. It's been off the past three years. I think it's a bit late this year. I recommend you go and read it. So as I mentioned before, boardroom love graphs. So interactive again, just by a show of hands, where does your role in cybersecurity lie in this chart? Is it one, two, or three? If it's none, raise your hands. If it's all of them, raise your hands. If it's just a couple, raise your hand. Okay, so the right answer is all of them, in my opinion. I'm not gonna force that down anyone's um, throat, but in my opinion, you cover all of those areas. Why? Because risk, the whole concept of this talk is about identifying risk. One of the abstract articles which surrounded my talk was 
a case study on credit card data. You will probably work in an infrastructure or customer supporting area where you support some sort of storage of personal information, whether it be credit card data, national insurance numbers. Are you aware where that's stored and how to access it? If you don't, find out. Ask someone who works in compliance. Poke the bear. There's nothing wrong with that. So we'll talk a little bit about the human element. So we refer back to what we call the elementary part of the sock. This sort of candy. Everyone knows this. You probably got it in your in your knocks and socks. It, this one is a little bit better than the, the, the fire eye stuff. It's actual tangible data. So what does this actually mean? Is that as a SOC analyst, and I'm talking explicitly to SOC analysts here, I've worked in SOCs, I've worked in numerous SOCs and NOCs, is that this part of your job is absolutely critical. Why? Because there are no days off. You may work shifts, you may work rotors, but when you walk out of that SOC or NOC, do you completely forget about your job? It may be a personal thing that that's the last thing on your mind once you walk out of there. But that is intrinsically linked to the human element of being able to communicate the risks outside your role to those at a higher level. And that's not a, um, a, a, a term that I would use lightly. Higher, being in hierarchy, not in status. So the reason I mention this is because a prime case study would be in the past couple of weeks there's been a incident where a number of zero days were dumped onto the internet. It was late at night UK time, I don't know what it was in the US. I use this as an example to be able to engage the incident response teams and say, listen, we've got heads up of what's happening right now. This may be a problem for you guys, you guys, and you guys. Can't really validate it at the moment because it's, you know, basically it's somewhere on the internet. What do I do? And that is a case study in itself, which is identifying risk early. So again, we go back to the SOC view. I'm, I, I love SOC analysts because they're so switched on. I'm a SOC analyst myself, a network defender. I like to think I'm switched on, maybe I'm not. Does anyone know what this is? Anyone use it? So it's Logstalgia, it's a visualization tool. Do you know what this particular one is visualizing? Does anyone know? This is a DDoS attack. That's also a DDoS attack. Which one would you choose to show to your board? Or an executive, or a CTO? It's the first one, of course. To the technical part of you, they both mean exactly the same. Exactly the same. If someone sent me a visualization like that, I'd say, what? excuse me, what is this? Someone sent me the other one. I'd have a fair understanding of what was going on. And that's how you communicate a risk and how you communicate a threat. You can use visualizations, you can use human elements, or you can just show them a timed out page. Your $100 million budget that you've got sitting behind this database is offline, or you can show the other one, depending on your viewpoint. Whatever gets the message across clearly. So we move on to risk intelligence. Does anyone know who this gentleman is? Yes, thank you very much. This is Ahmed Mansour. He was labelled a dissident by his own government. So we've got some comments to apply. He has been arrested. He has been imprisoned. He's been targeted by his own government for his human rights activities. So he's a target. He understands his, his status. He's been hacked a number of times. He communicates very quickly with his, what is effectively his incident response team, which is Citizen Lab. Anyone heard of Citizen Lab? Okay, so Sitson Lab at University of Toronto, just Google it, fascinating work. He was able to identify this risk very, very early. 20th of, this, of August, I believe it was, he received a text message, which basically, long story short on this part, contained three zero days for um, the iPhone. If he clicked it, he would have been popped. It's as simple as that. But he knew his status, he knew he was a target. So between the 20th and the 29th of August, he was able to communicate effectively what the risk was to his what was his incident response team and be able to get that out to the public. So on the 29th of August, it appeared on what I would call the BBC News, which is where your CTO reads the news, which is the last place you want to read news. I've got no raise preference on where the news should be reported, but if your CTO is reporting articles to you from the BBC, someone somewhere needs to have a quiet word. In my opinion, that is another case study on how to communicate news. The polar opposite to Mansoor is this lady. Not knowing where your status is, not knowing where you could be in a number of months, and not knowing how to communicate risk, 
there is one sliding scale here. One is a case study and one is one how, how to do it. The other one is how not to do it. Can you anyone tell me which one is which? <laughs> so we come on to this part, the interesting part. As I mentioned before, there was an incident last week, a couple of weeks ago, which basically, it was a tweet. I had it up before. So it was the equation group compromised. It was, for lack of a better word, unverified by a lot of people. It was developing over a number of hours. The conversation you probably had had this face as a result. Nobody knew how to respond. There is something on the internet that may affect all of our perimeter security. What do we do? That's basically the face that was pulled. But therein lies the answer is that you've already communicated this risk. You may not have the answers right now. In 24 or 48, you may have the fundamental answers with a bit of research. And we did. We managed to flesh it out. We identified early risk. And the threat didn't go away because obviously there's an inherent risk in this. The threat is still there. But that is a, a, a core principle of communicating effectively and quickly. So this is the ICO in the UK. These are some stats. I use the word lot, a lot, in this one, without any much. You can go and visit these and get these stats yourself, but I've tried to use a very unscientific equation, which is lot. The health sector have a lot of security incidents. Local government facts to the wrong people, a lot. Education, education, excuse me, lose a lot of unencrypted devices. Finance, insurance, and credit also post and fax to the wrong people. Does anyone see a theme here? Traditional technologies are failing, and there's a human element involved in them all. Now, this picture is one of the greatest pictures on the internet, in my opinion, because it comes with the phrase, it pays to understand the technology you're working with. It's not real, by the way. I don't know if you knew that. They are photo photo um, photoshopped. But the phrase that accompanies this picture is, it pays to understand the technology that you're working with. And that ties in slightly to the uh, no days off rule, or what I perceive as the no days off. That's not a literal rule. Obviously, everyone's entitled to a day off. But if you understand the technologies that you're working with, you can identify risks a lot quickly, a lot earlier. Acronyms. Who's a CISSP? OK. I've got no opinion on, on any of these. I've just used them as an example. So they both use a top-down approach to security from both bodies. They both believe that as a hierarchy of security, it should be pushed down from the top and be embraced from the bottom. One size fits all, which as a principle probably does work, or does it? There's nothing wrong with studying and suggesting otherwise. The principles that lie in both these bodies are fairly routinely criticized for a good enough reason. But for one reason or another, I don't believe a top-down approach to security works in every single environment. Maybe in one, maybe not in another. But these acronyms, which are associated with, with the study that go with them, I don't believe that they should fit everyone. So what you will find is that a lot of people on board members will accredit themselves with a, a CISM or a CISSP and think that, that this approach will work in every company they go to. Conversation pieces can get heated. They can be um, principled. But at the end of the day, you are a subject matter expert. They're probably not. Not just because they've got these acronyms after the name, but because you know better. If you're a SOC analyst trying to explain what a DDoS or a UDP reflection attack looks like, a CEO is not going to understand what that means. But being able to visualize it with the tools we've used probably will get them on board a lot quicker. Getting them on side, it's not easy. <laughs> But being able to show people the, te the technical expertise that you have in whatever way it, me it is, that doesn't mean hacking all the things, well, although it might in some cases. But being able to show what you can do to the board will get you on board. But situational awareness is absolutely critical. We use Hillary Clinton as an example. We used Ahmed Mansour as an example. Understanding your surroundings and have a situational awareness of what goes on around you will put you in good stead. Because if it doesn't, you can show them this picture. This is effectively what happened to Talk Talk. Again, I'll caveat that by saying I'm using Talk Talk as a case study, not as a yardstick. Because this is effectively what happened. When Talk Talk had their breach, a lot of people will have looked and said, There you go. That's exactly what could happen to us. Now, are you going to take notice or are you going to continue to put a risk around something? You know, the first slide I showed you with the um, wire ties and the lock? 
That's effectively what that was. So you can show them the slide and say, listen, the house on the road is on fire. Please don't let it be us. And communicate these risks. So thankfully, help is coming. We talk about these frameworks that are here to protect us. A new one. So in July 2016, some of the attacks that have happened over the past 10 years almost between the Ukraine and Russia have forced NATO's hand to identify that cyberspace is now the fifth domain of warfare. This effectively means that you can go to war with someone if they perform what, is they, what they call a cyber attack. That doesn't mean if China DDoS your firewall, you can go to war with them, but it effectively classifies that as an act of war. So don't go home and blame me if your firewall's offline by someone in Russia, please. That's another caveat. Part two. GDPR, conscientious. <laughs> the Independent Data Protection Officer, or the DPR. So this is a, a regulation put together before a very famous vote recently, which may need to be revisited. I'm not gonna talk about that at all, because it's a political minefield. But what I will say is this enforces the viewpoint that a lot of people may have. So I come in on Monday morning and there's a hole in my network and there's literally a server hanging out the wall. Someone's broken and stole all my data for human resources. What do I do? My boss comes in at half nine and says, oh, don't worry about that, we'll just get it fixed. That's not gonna happen anymore. People that brush these sort of instances under the, under the carpet, they will be obligated to inform legal entities about what's happened. So there's more support for your risk analysis. If you identify a potential risk, which is a human resources database of being passed around on a USB stick, which is a open window next to the server room, if you've identified this sort of risk and then becomes a threat six months down the line, GDPR is your boy. I made this phrase up. Has anyone used this phrase? Cybersplaining? It's for when traditional security risks just won't do. So that one, of the more secu one of the more traditional security risks are a lost USB pen or a laptop. What about these? And this. How many CTOs or CEOs understand either of what those two are? No? Mimi Cats, PowerShell Empire? Neither, probably none. And that's fair to say that they probably shouldn't, but they should have visibility of their capabilities and the impact. So, Ashley Madison, everyone understand the impact that had? They were attacked in part using PowerShell Empire. Being able to explain the impact of that attack and some of the artifacts that were discovered. So PowerShell Empire, for those that don't know, just raise your hands if you've never heard of PowerShell Empire. Okay, so PowerShell Empire is an attack framework used to deliver remote access. Well, effectively remote access. Just Google it. You'll be amazed about what it can do. You can play music remotely just using PowerShell. The problem with that is it becomes a lot of work to be able to identify that risk, but that's a whole different conversation. But identifying that risk early and saying there is a new genre or a new level of attacks which don't even touch disk. What does that mean? What are you saying to me? That's the conversation, that's how it goes. What do you mean it doesn't touch disk? It's, you've identified the risk, don't worry about that. Put it on the risk register and say, this is very important. Lockheed Martin Cyber Kill Chain. I'm assuming everyone's familiar with this one. If you're not, Understand the principles because they lead into every single part of cyber security and physical security in some respects too. I'm not gonna belabor the obvious and talk about this. If you already know about it, excellent, because it highlights risks for you. Gap analysis, perfect. You will turn up and poke the bear in so many different places if you follow this protocol. It works excellently. So the question for the people in the room, ask yourself this one. Where are your risks and threats? Is it an insider threat? Is it an adversary, which could be classed as an, as an insider threat? Is it mistakes, you know, the lost USB stick, the lost mobile phone? Put those risks on a register. Honey tokens, honey pots, internal honey tokens. Identify these people, identify these risks. These are all large scale changes that need to go before change advisory boards. I'm not saying go in and change the world. I'm saying identify these risks. The impact is the same. What that bit? Great, sorry. Was there an error on my screen? <laughs> Make this your goal. This goal 
doesn't effectively mean sitting in a boardroom, having a CEO conversation. It means having a presence. A large number of companies are now adopting a new officer role. So you will have a chief operating officer, chief financial officer, and a new role, which is exactly what we've been clamoring for, which is a chief digital officer. This is someone who works in a SOC or someone who analyzes applications or understands cyber threats well enough to be able to explain them to the board. This can be anyone in this room, absolutely anyone. If you're in this room today and you've attended this talk, you understand you are a subject matter expert. This can be you, and there's no reason why it shouldn't be. You understand the risks. You can appropriately communicate the risks before they become threats. So I think I'm running out of time, I think. So five minutes, so I'll speak very slowly. So takeaways, hopefully. Ingesting intelligence can be challenging and then disseminating them even more so, but this should help. Early eyes on visibility and communicating them should help. But please do not run an email server in the basement, especially if you're going to run for president. Q&A, so I've got a couple of minutes for Q&A and some details here. If anyone's got any questions, put your hand up. But if you don't have any questions, my email's there. Um, don't really answer emails, not about you guys. I try not to answer emails, because it, you know, it's not a very good way of communicating, I'm joking. Um, but my Twitter ID is there if you want to uh, pose any questions there. Thank you. Sorry, did you have a question? Yeah, so GDPR, so that's a regulatory, it's difficult to talk about it now because of what's happened. I don't profess to know everything I know what, about what it's going to do, but what it's going to do is give support for people who are in the position to make changes but can't make those changes. So the example I used before was that if there's been an incident which you're having resistance, resistance in reporting to the appropriate authority, GDPR will basically make the people in the boardroom sit up and have to report these incidents. That's due to coming in 2018, but it's subject to significant change. <laughs> to answer that. So the question was there, sorry, I need to repair it back, was talk a little bit more about GDPR. So if anyone's interested in that, there is a, a European legislation called GDPR. What, there was one slide on it and I didn't belabor it too much, but it's gonna basically make people in positions of power acknowledge risk a lot more and communicate that risk and be punishable for that risk, which basically helps all of us. Any more? Sorry, what was that? Brexit. I'm, I'm sorry, what was that? It was, it was and still is. So as far as I know, so I won't gloss over this, I'll try and answer it, is that as far as I know, we don't just because we, and I speak the collective we, sorry, we don't leave the EU in terms of legislation. We have agreed the legislation with the EU to report these incidents. Because of Brexit, I believe that will still be the case. I'm not a uh, EU specialist, but I believe we've, we're bound to some of these agreements now, subject to change. But as far as I'm concerned, that's helped for all of us. So the question was, how does a sector-specific CTO or CDO deal with these threats? Okay, so that's a good question, actually. So as part of my role within say, UK, we perform exercises. So we have, we have uh, utilities exercises where we will probably test the resilience of a utility sector incident. We'll run a mock incident, which will be um, maybe someone trying to hack a SCADA system and test the resilience that way. That, is a, that would probably be a benchmark we, we could then report on. You know, um, the CTO didn't respond to numerous text messages that there was a, a, a chlorine attack on a water filtration system. We could report on that, that the communication aspect was wrong. But that's just one element, uh, that's one uh, specific utility. Okay. I don't think they need to. So, the, sorry, the question for those that didn't hear it was, what do we think of people that use FUD for communicating? 
they don't need to use it, in my opinion. There's enough significant, I hate to use the word cyber attacks, but there's enough significant cyber activity out there at the moment that if quantified correctly, can get people on board. I don't think anyone needs to use FUD. I, I'm, I don't think I'm wrong in that. Um, I think there's been, what's been in the past 24 hours, Dropbox, Spotify, all instances of note. The, these sorts of risks are appropriately communicated and are on the radar and dashboard of CEOs, CTOs. That there's always breaches, almost daily breaches, or regurgitations of other breaches where they're properly quantified. There's absolutely no reason to use FUD. So to answer that question, sorry, is I've got no time for people to use FUD. They're in the position that they are inappropriately and they're using misinformation. That's my answer. Any more? No? Thank you very much, everyone.